Okay, can everyone see um, the presentation okay and hear me or read uh, the captions okay? Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah Saska. I'm the co-founder and CEO of an organization called Feminuity. So I'll get right into it. So who turns their lights on using their smartphone? Or who adjusts their thermostat using their phone? Or who streams their music to a speaker such as Alexa or locks their doors remotely? Smart home tech helps us to determine what temperature to keep our homes at. It helps us to keep our homes more safe. And sometimes it lets, it lets us even check in on our loved ones, maybe even our pets. But at the same time, smart home technology provides a new way for people to abuse others. Right, right now, reports abound of people who've been locked in their homes or had the temperatures in their homes change from extreme heat to extreme cold or had the lights flash on and off repeatedly or had music blare at random hours. Um, abusive people, abusers, are using smart home technology to control and harm others even when they're not in the home. And so in Canada right now, we know that smart home device use is set to grow by 60% by 2021. And at the exact same time in Canada, we know that seven out of 10 survivors of domestic violence are women and girls. So in this way, smart abuse disproportionately impacts women and girls. And smart abuse is an unintended consequence of smart home technology. So while it's you know, highly gendered, it's deeply gendered, we also know that there's so many other sort of vulnerable folks who risk being impacted by smart abuse, from folks who live with disabilities to those who are uh, of advanced ages and, and beyond. So the spread of COVID-19 has led us to, to, well, deploy technologies faster. The uptake has been you know, quite surreal. And while I don't know if technology can really save us, you know, perhaps beyond this crisis right now, I do know that there's a great chance that it will continue to enable the next generation of different types of discrimination, right? Whether that's classism or heterosexism or racism or colonialism or sizeism. So today we don't need you know, explicit forms of exclusion or discrimination, right? We don't need people using the C word or the N word or the R word to be sexist or racist or ableist or any of the, the above, right? We just need well-intended companies to get things wrong. So in an, an attempt to solve the problem of bias in recruitment and take the process of sorting through job applications to become you know, more efficient, Amazon built an AI screening tool. Ultimately, they wanted something that was more objective, more efficient, um, but what they quickly noticed was that their screening uh, tool was screening out resumes from women. So Amazon's recruitment tool screened out resumes with the names of women's colleges and even memberships to women's chess clubs. So why was Amazon's screening tool being sexist? Well, the screening algorithm was built using resumes that they had collected over the past decade. Right? And as it turns out, to, no, to not much of a surprise, the resumes were largely for men. And so the very foundation of this tool, right, the training data that Amazon's AI was built from, was biased. So the screening algorithm ultimately mimicked the biases that they found in the data, right? just like children pick up habits from, from the adults around them. So in, a, in an attempt to solve the problem of bias in recruitment and to make the process more efficient, Amazon ultimately designed a solution that was more biased and ultimately created more problems. So to address this, programmers edited the algorithm in an attempt to make it more gender neutral, but ultimately they concluded that neutrality just wouldn't be possible. An algorithm is simply a set of instructions, rules, and calculations, often to use to solve problems. So the initial training data set is absolutely critical. Right? And in this case, the, the decade of resumes, largely from men. Um, but these systems can be, also be biased based on how we use them, right? how we continue to interact with them, the questions we ask, the searches we make. We continue to shape all of these technologies in real time. 
So after all of that sort of time and energy and resourcing that went into this project to ultimately solve the problem of bias in recruitment and to make the problem uh, you know, less, less burdensome, Amazon ultimately had to scrap, scrap the tool. So we want solutions that are efficient and objective because um, ultimately we know that humans are flawed and busy and biased. And in times like these, tech is making so much possible, right? It's allowing us to make connections, it's allowing us to continue to work remotely for those who are part of the knowledge economy. Um, but, and after all, problem solving is very much at the heart of technology and innovation. But technology is not more objective than people. It's simply an extension of our history, right? It's, it's a reflection of our collective history, and it's also a reflection of our current and future behaviors. The feedback loops, whether from you know, bias training data or in the way that we use it, through our habits, through our questions, there's something that we really need to think about. Right? We're letting technologies right now in real time make decisions about our lives each day, whether that's in terms of big data or analytics or predictive algorithms or how AI penetrates you know, so many different areas of our lives. In real time right now, we're allowing technologies to determine who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets fired, who qualifies for loans, which type of political advertising we see. We're even seeing judges use technology, again, under the guise that technology is more objective than people. So we're seeing judges use technology to determine who to send to prison, who to, who to parole, and sometimes even who to sen sentence to life in prison. So we're witnessing faster deployment of systems than ever before in the, you know, in the midst of this crisis. And so this is the time to remain more, more vigilant than ever before about the technologies that impact our lives, right? We can't, can't let the promise of AI overshadow our real and present harms. The efficiency and the scalability of technology means that we can reproduce existing inequities at scale. And we can ultimately do that at warp speed right now. Facebook's original motto was move fast and break things. But my question is, you know, how does that account for the systems that are, are already broken or the people that are already hurt? Right? A tiny sliver of the population can't design and build technology that impacts the rest of the world. So tonight, my message really is just, you know, we all have a role in this you know, to the folks who are artists and creatives and storytellers and designers and innovators, the maintainers and sustainers, right? Especially the folks who are working, you know, in the front line in real time right now, right? We need everyone to be part of this, uh, collect, like shaping our collective future. Because ultimately our brains are one of the biggest pieces of technology that we have. So as Margaret Atwood reminds us, um, better never means better for everyone it always means worse for some. And I think her words remain true unless we act, right? And ultimately do things differently. And I think especially in this moment during a time of crisis, this is where we have the chance to actually sort of, you know, play with these fractures and these systems. So at, at Feminuity, we're working to build a more equitable future through technology and innovation. So we support companies, largely those in the tech and innovation ecosystem, to both you know, build diverse teams, as well as to empower people on these teams to hold us all to a more ethical standard and to bring inclusive design principles into everything that we're doing. Because ultimately, we believe that technology will be most powerful when we're all empowered by it. So thanks, everyone. Um, and special thanks to Tanya uh, on, on with us tonight for designing this deck. Awesome, thank you. Uh, round of applause virtually everyone. Um, feel free to put comments in the chat. Uh, and I think we have time for a few questions. So yeah, are you okay to answer a few questions? Yeah, for sure. All right, if you have a question, uh, just in the chat, put a Q letter and that'll add you to the queue. I'll demonstrate. All right, uh, Pratt, do you want to go first?
Pratt, feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat if you Yeah, can. sorry, uh, I can speak. Uh, thanks for that, Sarah. Uh, really good to have you with us today. Um, my question is, uh, given that we have so many biases through the technology that is inbuilt, um, what can, uh, I mean, as a community, as civic tech members do and you know, basically not do to have these biases further built in? And also what can government as policies can do about this? Uh, how can we make this better? Yeah, so I think from our perspective, I see sort of these things at through sort of three major levels. So one is certainly, you know, at the macro, whether that's sort of governmental or, you know, organizational wide, setting the ethical standards um, and, you know, really being clear on the expectations that folks need to follow those. Um, also, I think it you know comes down to sort of the middle of the pack, right? Folks who are sort of managing and leading in between, um, making sure that folks are sort of well versed in what's sort of what's needed to actually lead teams through these types of complex um, problems. And then the other sort of pieces of it is around shaping diverse teams. Um, and I think what's really important is to understand that when I say that, I don't mean that individuals are diverse. Right. Too often we hear that folks, uh, you know, folks saying, you know, we need to bring, you know, a diverse person onto this team. Right. Diversity is a relational concept and the value of diversity is is most deeply understood in the sort of the relations between people. Right. So bringing a sort of a range of folks, people who look, feel and think differently to the table, you know, folks with nonlinear career paths, um, folks from you know, different parts of the world, you know, sort of all sorts of different lived experience to the table. Um, that's that's what we really need. Um, at any sort of team or sort of micro level when it comes to sort of designing. All right, uh, Sarah Park, feel free to go next. Uh, hi, Sarah. Um, I was wondering, you said that uh, the data that they start with has a big impact on how uh, AI can be um, biased so is there a way to like maybe scrub the data or parse the data to kind of um you know today's standards um and tr to make it them avoid the pitfalls that they've been making for the past 10 years yeah so it, it's interesting I, like that's that's the big question right now and so the example with with the amazon recruitment screening tool ultimately the developers at amazon determined that it wasn't possible um, because while they could work to um, effectively make the data, like the data set sort of more gender neutral, what they quickly found, and this sort of wasn't what became publicly understood through the, the media and news cycle, was that the data set just revealed other types of bias, right? So that initial sample was largely from men, uh, technical men, but it was also largely from white men, presumably able-bodied men, presumably cis men. Like there's, there's a lot of other sort of presumptions that we can make, right? Um, and that's what they quickly found is that while they could sort of work to mitigate maybe one one bias at a time, others quickly revealed themselves. And then the other side of it is, you know, in terms of how users were actually well, use, using the technology, right? So it continues to evolve in real time as well. Okay. So it, it, from my understanding, it doesn't seem like there's sort of a perfect solution right now. Okay. This is, you know, very much a work in, in, in progress. Okay. Thanks. All right, awesome. We have a question from Andrew. Um, so it's in the chat. So can you give an example of a project you are working on right now for this? Yeah, so well, one of the, the projects that we're working on, I mean, we, we certainly do a ton of consulting work, but we also love to really, you know, get our, our sort of our hands in um, research studies. So we're, we've been working on a project with, with Google uh, Mountain View on product inclusion uh, for the past uh, while now, which is ultimately uh, geared to be sort of an open source tool with some some standards around uh, the development of sort of more more ethical AI. And the the data set has been built actually looking at the diff some of Google's different tools and finding some of the gaps and blind spots that have revealed themselves over the years. So it's uh, it's cool. They're being you know really open and sort of vulnerable and forthcoming about 
you know, where they've gone wrong and then sort of how they're working to, to resolve that. So um, that's a project that we're really excited about um, and hopefully should come out, I think, in the next few months. All right, awesome. And uh, we have one more question. Uh, if anyone else has a question, feel free to add those uh, cues in the chat. But we have one more from Skydra right now. Hi, this is super interesting. Thanks for joining us. Um, I have more of like a comment question, per mm -hmm. not even sure what it is, but I always think of this from the context of like online dating. And when you think of online dating, you, you, you see like the nicheification of it, right? Like you see these platforms that are like specifically for like, I don't know, like certain profiles, certain interest groups. And so I was wondering if you have done any work on data collection and data bias in online dating platforms, or if you have any comments to share on that industry. I'm just so fascinated. Mm, I'd say, I mean, we did a bit of advising with Bumble, um, but that was more related to safety features, right? Like how to actually sort of work with, you know, location features and also sort of safety based in, you know, stats on, you know, gender-based violence. So not as much to date, unfortunately. Okay. I can. I have lots of research that I can share, and I would very happily share those. So um, please email me, and I will send yeah, you cool, like, cool. folders. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Any more questions in the chat? All right. Not seeing any. I think I'll call it there. Um, yeah. Round of applause once again. Thank you so much, Sarah. Awesome. Thank you all.